uh, North Africa. He was traveling in his youth. He went to North Africa about about every other every five years, and he went for six or nine months at a time. It wasn't worth it because getting there at the first, when you had to travel down to Marseille, partially with train, partially with coach, wait for a ship that was going in your direction, probably take it to Malta, get to Malta, these ships weren't scheduled, and then have to get another boat to get you to Cairo or to get you to Alexandria. He organized huge, uh, what you call them, groups of people to go, 10 to 12 of his friends, artists and writers, because it was so expensive and they shared the expenses. And they sketched and painted on the way, they took boats up the Nile, they went to Fayoum, and they finally got put together a, a, a great uh, through a dragoman, and uh, Jerome learned Arabic probably on the trips and probably from talking to his models. And they would go across the Sinai Peninsula to the Jordan, Aqaba, the Jordan Valley, up to Jerusalem and Damascus and home. This would take six months. Friends died, there were accidents, dysentery, uh, insects, great heat, sandstorms, saddle uh, blisters. Uh, but they all, so many of them loved it, they went there again and again. And it also the love of, the antique, of, of North Africa and the Islamic costumes and the color uh, was very deep. It's very strange to think of him as someone eternally criticizing the East. For instance, that scheme of the slave buyer putting his hand in the mouth of a slave, he painted earlier in a Roman setup. Or is it was not deemed to be very pro good. This woman, this picture has, as you can see, it was wonderfully sensuous, great breasts and the nipples speaking through the, the cloth, the, the thin cloth, it's just the beautiful arm seen in the cloth, and this great look. He actually gives her a strong nose and a mouth and a chin. It's, you know, stronger than what we've seen before. This burnt down in a private collection uh, two years ago, like you almost think it set the fire. <laughs> but it's a great picture and a great loss, but I think this happens. Let's have the next, please. Now I want to show you, there's always something going on in Jerome's pictures that you have to look at. You have to have a conversation with the picture like Poussin wanted. And Poussin's always in the mind of every French history painter He's just the great national painter, the saint of the Russian painting, I mean a French painting. This looks like just a street scene in Cairo, and the man is selling, is thinking of buying a sword from a passing a Jewish merchant. We know the Jewish merchant from the hat, and because the street merchants are always Jewish. And there's a background. I didn't notice the colors are quite bright. Uh, the man with the strongest local colors, of course, the man looking at the sword. And if you look, the, the different arts, the different skirts, the white skirts, are all varied in values to set the group back. When you see most groups by Jerome, you can practically put your hand in them. They're so carefully differentiated. It's an incredible skill he had, even when he was young. But there's something more going on in this picture. Let's have the next, please. When you look up close, you can see the, the Jew is rather astonished by something. And you can see that the twist in the red ma man with the red skirt, he has walked up to this merchant without an ado, has pulled the, the, not, the sword out of the scabbard, rather insulting, and immediately turns to show it to his friend, not even saying, pardon me or thank you, and this poor man is just sitting there astonished at another insult. You don't see those things if, if, when you get up too close. You have to stand back and you have to think through with the characters and what we some call kinetic sympathy or just feel the motion that the actors, that the people are going through. I was taught this in Munich in archaeology where we were taken to the basement of casts and we had to take the pose of every statue there. And then we were told, that, uh, is it authentic? Do you have the same reaction in your muscles when you lean like the discus thrower? Do you feel it in your upper arm and your shoulders? Can you read it in the statue? If it didn't, well, then it's a Roman copy if you didn't get it. 
<laughs> but that was a, an exercise we had regularly. And Jerome did this too in class, and, and put people posing. And you notice again the colors are quite stark. Then I haven't seen this in black and white, but I don't think it would be very, very strong. It's one of the reasons I'm going to Paris, because it's in the Paris show, not here. May I have the next, please? And then something else. That, it, this is a Baroque scene. It gets, it's another very, very good picture. It's, it's in the show here, isn't it? Yes. It's about Moliere and Corneille. They were both told by the court, by Louis XIV's court, to work together on doing a mask. That's not a, a big entertainment for the court with dancing and ballet and activities. Moliere is the young, is the young realist. Corneille is the old idealist. And is, uh, just sits there with great confidence, writes and writes and writes, and then rewrites. And you can see there's Corne uh, Moliere twisting in his chair while he listens, <laughs> just with impatience and just with contempt almost. Not well, shouldn't have had it for Corneille, a great dramatist. I have the next clip. Five. What? Five. Ten minutes? Five. Five? Yeah. <laughs> well, then something. Okay, we'll go quickly. They're in the last room of, of the exhibition. There are quite a few statues. Jerome, about 57, just considered an old age, he signed his sculpture. His, his friends who were sculptors said, You've got to do it. You have such a strong plastic sense. Here he is working in his studio on a plaster with a model right next to it. He probably has a caliper somewhere where he go measure the thickness of the leg and, and the model and back to the statue. Uh, up on the wall you can just barely see the picture, his picture of Pygmalion coming to life, uh, of the statue coming to life, from uh, Galatea she's called it, from, to life for him. And he's going to, to paint the statue when it gets done. First he'll do a plaster. He won't do the carving and marble. That'll be given to a technician. He'll just do the touching up. Now the catalog says that he had a photograph to paint himself, not Jerome. He had an artist come in, a good artist whom he knew draw his portrait, because he knew that the information in a portrait was not the information in a photograph was not the information you needed to, that you could use for painting a portrait. But a drawing by an artist would put that information actually. Now we'll, we'll go just a little. I'm told I should get. <clears throat> and something starts happening as he uh, works on sculpture. He gets more and more exact. The idealism is still there, but he does risky sculpture. This is a concoction. It's uh, underneath all of that. There is a plaster, the plaster that he did of this woman, Corinthia, of, of, or Lydia, the, the, a famous prostitute in the city of Corinthia. She sits in one version at the, at, in the show on a, on, a, um, on, a, on a Corinthian capital. This was the last work he was doing. He had just had it finished enough the night before he died that he took people into a studio and put jewelry on it. And it exists in many versions. This is a small bronze. Oh, even when Jerome was at the height of his bad reputation, these were very expensive. But then something happens. He becomes, he suddenly sees, I'm painting the statues, but I've been idealizing them, making them. And he starts painting ugly poses with ugly models or with ugly distortions, wrinkles around their belly, sagging breasts. Uh, very uncomfortable poses. Next, please. And here's a very uncomfortable one, very strange. Look at the, the, the fat around her belly. It's there. You see it in the models, and most people draw it away. The arm, the, the right arm is not beautiful. It sags and pulls out. This is very, uh, quite remarkable of him. He's an older man. He's in his late 70s. Most people realize the pretty things up a little bit. In fact, they, but he is persisting in this realism, even to the point that it seems to some unpleasant, to me unpleasant. I, I love them because they look like poses you do for drawing in, in a good class if you have a model that can hold something like that. Well now, 
And, here, and some people didn't like the realism. This is a portrait of Sarah Bernhardt. He gave her the plaster, painted so it looked like bronze. Now she, she was a student of Jerome. She did sculpture. She was posed in photograph after photograph. She's posing in her house with statues by Jerome, bronze and all that. She kept the self-portrait, the portrait of herself in the closet. Why? Because you look at it and you can say 54. <laughs> there she has you know, this uh, tragedy and comedy down below. It's, and here it's painted and it, it used to be brighter but the paint fades. It's pigment mixed with wax and rubbed into the statue. Now I want to show you what did I learn about from looking at these shows? I never knew Jerome was so good as what we call making a picture, making everything go together with not just the drawing and the composition and the way you read the incident, among one incident, but it's just everything. He painted with absolute care, no faltering, uh, not like Moreau who put so much details in his canvases that he couldn't finish them. Everything painted quite well. Nothing bragging. This is a strange picture. That's one of the uh, uh, Arno keepers of the Hun, Hound blowing smoke out. Now look at the composition. It's quite simple. Triangle, the two triangles, like the dog and the man together, and that's rather affectionate. There are triangles in his skirt, both large, and they keep coming down and become uh, down to that round uh, the, the picture around them tray on top of the, of the, um, the stand, and then the color is quite strong. Now let's have the next one. You have to, this is something, this is the key to the whole picture. This tray, this round tray, links uh, practically every line together that's in the picture, sets up the space. And notice how uh, it has a still life on it that you don't even notice the first time around and again. It blanks the picture and it sort of sets up the relationship of the man and the dog. Uh, he's followed the, the, the uh, mother of pearl that is under the, um, on the stand. The values are absolutely fine. There's a space between that, under that tray that's quite remarkable. You wouldn't think he'd, anyone would go to all that trouble unless he really knew how to do it. Let's have the next one, please. That's the, the still life. And this is just done without any showing off, not even a detail, but just with the thoroughness of, ap of real integrity and that he's going to finish the picture. Let's go back again. And then one more. So it comes out, and then you can see something else, the way the tile goes back around the room, changing in values as it goes in the, to a darker spot on the left. Then you can see the, the pattern on the on the pillows goes back to you know an immense amount of work that many people would have just indicated so there's something he has this he has an idea and he chases the idea to the very end just as he chased the idea of of realism in the statuary to the end something else that comes up he's hard to classify is he an orientalist or is he a painter of cl uh, classical scenes is he a painter of, of contemporary scenes like the duel after the ball uh, a portrait painter, just his invention, as you see when you go to the show, seems to be endless, one picture after the other. When you walk through the picture, looking at them from a distance, you'll be surprised how solid they are. Everything in its place, but nothing really annoying. So I have a greater respect for them than I ever had, because the first time I got to see all these, the way he worked with colors, and the way he worked with with minor, the minor uh, uh, pictures and important pictures, more important scenes, all of them were done with integ equal integrity and equal thoughtfulness, and with uh, a technique about with values and figures. That's really, really a wonderful painter, and I have more respect for him than I ever did. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>